Welcome everyone to our webinar today on how the CRT debate and the culture wars are impacting students in Tennessee. My name is Jeannie Pupo Walker and I'm the state director for the Education Trust in Tennessee. The Education Trust is a national nonprofit that works, close, works to close opportunity gaps that disproportionately affect students of color and students from low income backgrounds. Through our research and advocacy, EdTrust supports efforts that expand excellence and equity in education from preschool through college, increase college access and completion, particularly for historically underserved students. We engage diverse communities dedicated to education equity and try to increase political and public will to act on equity issues. We are so excited to work in partnership with Chalkbeat to host this event today and to have an opportunity to hear from students, from educators and experts on this issue. The Education Trust in Tennessee has been working closely during this legislative session following multiple bills uh, that are moving through the General Assembly that seek to censor or limit the teaching uh, of our full history and to limit conversations about that in classrooms. We have been working uh, with a coalition of partners across the state that includes students, educators, parents, advocates. We recently launched a resource hub called Truth in Classrooms with links to tools, presentations, and ways to act. I'd like to now introduce the members of the Chalkbeat team who will take it from here. Please welcome Marta Aldrich, who's the Chalk, who's Chalkbeat Tennessee's senior state house, state house correspondent, who has reported extensively on topics worth talking about today. I'm also pleased to introduce Catherine Stout, who's the bureau chief for Chalkbeat Tennessee and today's moderator. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jeannie, and I'm gonna kick it off. Um, really any government restrictions being placed on what and how instruction can happen in the classroom are key coverage issues for Chalkbeat, especially on teaching about the painful parts of our nation's history and how they connect with present day injustices. So we're closely following both the application of last year's CRT law and the implications of more recent legislation that could make it easier for certain books or learning materials to be banned at the local level. And we know based on monitoring by the American Library Association that the books that are most challenged, na challenged nationally deal with issues of race and gender. So let's start with CRT, also known as the prohibited concepts law because it prohibits teachers from wading into 14 concepts on racism, sexism and bias that sponsors have termed as cynical or divisive. And among those concepts are that the United States is fundamentally or irredeemably sexist or racist, and that any individual is inherently privileged, racist, sexist, or oppressive because of race or gender. Now, this is the first year that Tennessee has been under this law, but for all practical purposes, it took effect in November after Commissioner Schwinn signed off on emergency rules developed by the Department of Education for monitoring, regulating, and enforcing the law. Now those rules didn't address the law's vagueness or what specifically teachers can and can't teach, but it, they do lay out potential penalties against teachers and districts that knowingly violate the law as well as who is eligible to file a complaint. It's been unclear how many complaints are going to be filed under these new rules since critical race theory is taught mostly in higher ed, not K-12 schools. It's also challenging to monitor because complaints have to be filed directly to districts or charter schools and handled there. And Tennessee has 147 districts and over 100 charter schools. So frankly, 
we need your help there. If you hear of any complaints filed with local schools, uh, specific, specifically over this particular law, please relay that to us because this is something we're trying to keep up with. Um, regarding book bans, we've been reporting a number of about a number of bills that could make it easier for districts to pull books and other content from school library shelves. Last week, Governor Lee signed into law his own plan aimed at scrutinizing uh, library materials for age appropriateness. Now this law will require each public school library to publish the list of materials in their collections and periodically review them to make sure they're appropriate for the age and maturity levels of students who can access them. It also requires school boards and charters to establish processes for receiving public feedback and removing books that don't meet that standard, which really is already in place as a best practice for school libraries. Another harsher school library bill continues to advance, and that is HB 1944, SB 1944, sponsored by Representative Sapicki and Senator Hensley. The House approved that bill Monday night and the Senate Ed Committee passed it the following day. This bill would require districts or charters to pull books from library shelves. If a parent or guardian complains the content is obscene or harmful to minors, a local school board or charter school governing body would then have 30 days to decide whether to permanently remove the material based on local community standards. So basically the materials are considered guilty until proven innocent. And the state would withhold, could withhold funds from schools that don't comply uh, this bill also would open up school librarians to face criminal penalties if their collections include materials that some find um, to be obscene. And among the concerns, of course, are how obscenity would be defined based on local community standards and worries that school leaders will feel pressure to proactively pull titles from shelves just to avoid controversy. Um, there's another bill, but I won't get into that. Um, uh, just because of time restraints, but, but that is some background to center this conversation. And now, now I'll turn it over to our moderator, Catherine Stout, who is the Bureau Chief of Chalkbeat, Tennessee. Catherine. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Marta, for that comprehensive mm -hmm. overview. Um, in case you didn't realize it in that overview, Marta is one of the best on the beat, and I tremendously uh, enjoy working with her. She gave us a lot to think about. Fortunately, we have a good panel who's going to help us kind of unlock and figure out some of these things and discuss some of these things today. And so I would like to just, uh, introduce our panelists for you today. Joining us are Dr. Karen Streeter, also known as Dr. K. Dr. K is a licensed education psychologist, motivational speaker, author, former college administrator, and host of a radio and social media show here in Memphis. We also have Anne Barnado, or as her students call her, Miss V. Miss V teaches ELL and world history at Hillwood High School in Nashville. Next, we have some of our wonderful students. Jamal Wright. Jamal Wright is a senior class of 2022 at Bluff City High School here in Memphis. We also have one of our students, Angeli Kimbo. Angeli is a senior at Hillwood High School and serves as a student representative for the Nashville School Board. Our third student joining us today is a junior. Her name is Ivy Eni. Ivy is a junior at Farragut High School in Knoxville, Tennessee. And our final panelists here, last but of course not least, we have Dr. Dyrese George. Dr. George is the founder and executive director of the Tennessee Educators of Color Alliance. So as you can see, we have a wonderful, wonderful group of panelists who come from all types of different backgrounds and different perspectives and across the state. We have all regions of the state covered. But we always wanna start with our students because at Chalkbeat, we really value student voices. And so I'm gonna throw my first question out to our three students on, on the panel. Um, 
what are you hearing from your peers about this issue, about critical race theory, about the culture war in the classroom? Are they talking about it? Are your parents talking about these issues? What are you hearing from your peers and your parents? Um, I can go first. So in my community and at my school, um, there is really no talk about it. And I can at least say this for the Farragut area. Um, when it comes to social issues as a whole, social issues as a whole, my community is very like quiet. They aren't participating in really any movement or anything like that. So it sometimes can be a little frustrating when you care about an issue, but no one else around you is really caring for it. So when it comes to issues like these, um, you know, our representatives are voting for it, but people either don't care enough to speak about it, don't even know much about the issue, or we'll just go along with what the representative says and support bills that are harmful. I will say that throughout Nashville, I have been hearing more talk about um, the spill specifically from teachers um, compared to the students. I do still hear um, student input on this bill. We actually had some instances of students leading marches to the Capitol. Um, in opposition of this bill. Um, but for me specifically, some of my teachers in my AP classes have been kind of cognizant and weary about what they talk and how they teach certain materials because of the restrictions that this bill imposes on, on the classroom. Um, from what they said, I can piggyback off of them. As um, far as student-wise, there's really no talk about it. Um, but like in the previous year, concerning uh, Breonna Taylor and, and George Floyd, there's been a little chit chatter here and there, but as um, far as that conversation, really, there's really none at all. So uh, I thank you guys for sharing that student perspective. What I'm hearing, um, their silence, um, their uncomfortable pauses from teachers, Ivy says that sometimes she feels, um, I don't know if isolated is the right word, but when you care about something and you're passionate about something, but there seems like a void in the conversation. Uh, I'm wondering how does that make you guys feel as students? Um, how does it feel to be passionate about an issue or to feel like there's something that actually, there's an elephant in the room here that's not being addressed or my teachers are approaching topics a little bit differently than I've noticed in the past. How does that make you feel um, as students? I can go again, <laughs> sorry. Um, but it's, it's kind of hard to, it's not too hard to deal with, but it is difficult knowing that, like you said, you know, you care about an issue, but no one's really talking about it. Um, and kind of your community, which is very important because that, like in your area, if your area is not caring about it, how do you get other people to care about it? And um, I went to this um, event called Day on the Hill where I was able to go to the Capitol and listen in to committee hearings for certain bills like the House Bill 1944, which was mentioned earlier, along with other bills. And it was very disheartening to um, see what was happening in the, what kind of bills are being passed. But it also was kind of, um, hurtful or um, disheartening to come back to my community and, you know, just know that nobody is paying attention to like what's going on there. There's no conversation about it. People probably don't even, aren't even aware about these bills. And um, it, it is hard because if the community is upset enough about it, then that can help create movement for a new legislature. But if there's no talk, then they can just keep doing what they're doing. Just to build off, I honestly feel the same too. Um, just kind of sad and disheartened of how our legislators are taking this issue at hand. Um, specifically, it's going to directly impact the students and how they learn in the classroom environment. The nature of this bill was to remove sort this sort of restriction and bias from the school system, but instead I feel like it's actually adding more restriction and kind of limiting the access of how students get 
information that they need that's directly impacting them. Um, over the summer, I was a part of um, Tennessee's Governor School for International Studies, and there, um, so many people with different backgrounds and different ideas um, could have an open space to talk about the things that are happening within the state and within the country. And then when I came back to school, it just kind of limited this quality discussion that I believe that every student has the right to have access to and every student should have the right to have quality discussions that kind of challenge the way that they think and challenge the way that the adults feel like we have to think. Just to piggyback off what they said, but to me it's more frustrating and confusing and also awkward because when we're um, watching the news and just getting um, the source of information, um, and when we come back to our school communities, there's no teachings of what the news is giving us and no one is really talking about it. And it makes me wonder like, what's going on? Like, um, is it something to hide? Why is the information not being leaked inside of schools and information not going out to students? Yeah, I just want to uplift some important things I, I heard. I heard silence and I heard limiting quality discussions. I think we just need to take a minute and I'll hear that again, limiting quality discussions. Um, Anne and Dyrese, I wanna bring you guys in as people who are close to teachers and you're in the classroom. Dyrese, I know you work with teachers all the time. Um, how does it make you feel, first of all, to hear that, to hear students say, there's something that's going on in our state that's limiting quality discussions. And what are you hearing from educators or what are you feeling in classroom? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. I think, again, it goes back to, to um, the, the idea that um, that limitation is a real thing. And, I, and it's not it doesn't just take place in the K-12 space. You know, um, some of the most egregious challenges that we're trying so hard to limit out of school settings around race, gender, systemic challenges and equities are some of the same things that our young folks on this call when they graduate are gonna have to face as adults in society. And we should be using the education space as a, as a, as a lever to be able to prepare them for that. But instead we continually limit that constantly 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 and for a space where most most students are spending anywhere between eight to 12 hours a day we should be using it as an opportunity to be able to engage with those particular issues and challenges in those topics of discussion so the fact that you said limited conversations that it, it was limited when i was a student it was limited probably before my point in time and it's continuing to hear in another generation in 2022 sad to hear that uh as far as educators go you know it depends on where you are and i think it's kind of reflective of what's been said already depending on where you are are um, folks who are, you know, progressively engaged with this topic and they understand what's going on, they're, they're finding ways to be somewhat resistant and trying to continue to teach in ways that they've always had because they know that it is not uh, breaking the law, you know, um, they're honoring history and they're honoring the students and they're valuing the students. But I do think that, you know, all of us are kind of experiencing this at the same time. And the, the big challenge here with some people is risk. Some people are not touching this at all. And they are contributing to the limitation of conversation because they're fearful of losing their job. They're fearful for being the spotlight in their district or in their school and seeing their district fine. And so, um, or worse, losing, uh, or worse, losing their teaching license. And so I think that as we're navigating this uh, across the state in real time, depending on how people are are, are are taking what they're learning and being resistant and, 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 and being really engaged with the opportunity to be able to make sure that they're still creating that sense of value with their students and staff, it's very different space to space, leader to leader. You know, folks who are able to keep doing what they're doing, it's because leaders have allowed them and afforded them the opportunity to do so. Others who have not, it's because they, they probably feel ostracized, discomfort, and fearful, and, and they don't want to risk it. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that, um, and just thinking about how this is different from school to school and educator to educator, um, Angela and I are both at Hillwood, and when all of these, um, these laws started being passed, our administration never took down the Black Lives Matter posters in our schools. Um, I had a kid that walked in, and we had been making protest posters because we're we were learning about apartheid in South Africa, um, and a lot of the kids wanted to talk about Black Lives Matter, and he came in my classroom, and he said, Miss V, we can't talk about Black Lives Matter anymore. And as an African-American kid, and just, he was so disappointed because he was so engaged. It's, 
relevant to his life. It's something he'll take with him um, as he moves on from the school. Um, rob a kid of an opportunity to talk about their identity, to talk about the world around them um, is such an injustice to me. Um, so I think for me and in my school, um, I've stuck to what I know, which is to teach history um, in the way that is true and to stand with our students and their identities and to say to them, like, you're safe here. You're safe to explore um, these things that are difficult and these things that affect you and your families. Um, and that goes for students you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and students who have families in detention centers. There's so many different ways that this affects our students. Yeah, I think those were excellent points. And I'm gonna bring Dr. K in in a minute, but I wanted to follow up with um, with Ms. B and Dr. George. Um, how would you describe the level of polarization this year compared to previous years? Um, and are there any places that you're seeing that are hot spots? You guys mentioned that it might be different from district to district, from city to city, from school to school. Uh, who, where are the hot spots in Tennessee? And where are the places who are, are navigating um, this kind of political climate well? I can speak to that. Um, I have some friends who are educators in neighboring counties. Um, so when you think about Wilson County, Williamson counties, that maybe not have the diversity of student population where the administration and the educators have really, you know, had to make a decision about if they're going to stand with their students and their identities um, in a strong way or not. Um, administration is not being supportive of teachers having um, in conversations about these injustices, um, about being truthful about history. Um, and there's a lot of fear there. There's a lot of polarization there. So the, my room and what's in my room, the posters, the political statements, the teachers in other districts are shocked that I would put that in my room right now. Um, so I think I speak from a real point of privilege of being in Davidson County and having a supportive administration because that's not the case in other schools. Yeah, and I, I think the, you know, to, to, to what's just been described, it really boils down to the educator, literally. Because um, you can be within the building um, where those that polarization is still very much real and alive between educators within the same building. Um, but I think the, the, the educators where the dividing factor is, and we were talking earlier, I know in Ivy's district, um, you know, we, we support, um, we're doing some supporting work there around some recruitment and retention efforts. And, you know, literally on different ends of the district, you know, you have a space where, you know, folks are not as, as much engaged in talking about it, but then there's another school where, you know, there are folks who are trying to bring in supplementary and complementary materials around discussions to complement, I believe, um, I almost want to say it was To Kill a Mockingbird was the book. I can't remember the book, don't charge, charge it to my head, not my heart, but was getting pushed back around bringing in complementary and supplementary materials to to align with the discussion around the book because this particular educator was trying to make the point of like some of the same issues that are apparent in this text are also apparent in real life that kids are facing or seeing and there was a lot of pushback from a department chair from the district around being able to do that and so literally same district different parts of the communities, uh, I mean same district different communities within the district but different educators and how they're navigating it just obviously shows up differently. And in that polarization, I think it's felt even more depending on the school environment that you're navigating and working in. Yeah, I really appreciate that. As a, as a former English teacher, you know, whenever I hear there's controversy around to kill a mockingbird, of course, my heart just drops, right? Uh, it's such a powerful and important book. Um, and, and your points remind me of a conversation I had with Dr. Natasha Robinson, who talks about the legacy of hard history, right? Do you teach history as something that is frozen and that is past, or do you teach it as something that has uh, contemporary ramifications, implications? Yeah, Dr. K, I saw you scribbling notes. <laughs> I, I know in your field you are a note taker, and I saw you scribbling a lot of notes as yes. um, our panelists were talking. What are mm -hmm. you hearing? Um, uh, I just want to—I want to start there. What are mm -hmm. you hearing? Uh, that's well. Right to you. I was writing down all of the emotions every emotional word, every feeling word that uh, people mentioned and none of them were positive. I heard uh, frustrated, isolated, uncomfortable, uh, disheartened, hurt, sad, confused, awkward, anxious, 
ill-equipped, disappointed, stressed, and confused. That's a lot of negative energy, a lot of negative emotions on both the side of the students and the teachers. And that's a lot to have to deal with when you're trying to also teach every day and learn every day. So uh, I'm wondering, you know, I know it's affecting learning and teaching, but to what degree is it affecting learning and teaching? Because oftentimes in my um, line of work, when students have all of these negative emotions, we actually have a disability for students who experience these emotions to a certain degree, which is emotional disturbance. And those children actually um, are so um, not able to learn because of their emotions, they actually have to have special education services. So it's like, are we creating a new group of students who are really emotionally overwrought and not able to perform at their best level as scholars? Yeah, I love how you put that perform at, at their best level. Uh, and I know you work mainly with students, but you have an ear mm -hmm. to the teachers, right? Oh, yes. So many mm -hmm. conversations this year on teacher stress, teacher burnout. Mm -hmm. teacher yes. Um, yes. What are some things that administrators can do if their teachers are trying to navigate these, you know, overwhelming negative emotions from all the different angles, from the pandemic, from mm -hmm. returning in person, and then from legislation that is forcing mm -hmm. them to change, adapt, and get rid of some of the things that they think are valuable for students? On access mm -hmm. and levels, what can administrators do to support um, mm -hmm. their teachers? What can teachers do to support their students who might be feeling these things? Well, um, and I, I work about evenly with teachers and students and parents. Um, and one thing I believe that administrators can do, because they may have a whole different understanding or even opinion about what should be happening, but is to, number one, monitor. You need to monitor, you need to look at, ask questions and keep your ears open to look for what I call those desolate Ds, even among, among adults and children. Are they disruptive? Are they disengaged? Are they dreamy? Meaning, are they looking off into space and not really paying attention? Do they seem depressed? Are they danger watching? Meaning, are they really anxious? Look for those things, look for changes in your teachers. And then always let them know that you're open to communication. And you don't have to necessarily respond back or even repair what's going on with them, but you can listen and then provide resources for those adults who need them. Oftentimes there's an EAP there um, through their insurance where they can go and talk with people in confidence so they can really work through whatever experiences they're having. And then for teachers, it's the same thing. You want to monitor your students. And I like to say to teachers, you always want to do a check-in at the beginning of the day, especially when things are going on like this. Sometimes kids will tend to slow down or shut down. So one thing you can do is just stand at your door and at the beginning of your class, ask every, ask every student to either give you a thumbs up for, hey, I'm doing great today or a thumbs down for not so great today. And if it's not so great, then you go to that student and you try to figure out what their needs are. Do they just need to speak with you or do they need to go out and speak with a guidance counselor or exactly how do you need to connect them with resources? Another way you can do that is through a numerical scale. And I would say one to three for kindergarten through third, one to five for four through eight, and then one to 10 for um, the rest of them, basically. And you would say, you know, on a scale of one to three, one through five, or one through 10, tell me how you're feeling today, with one being the worst you've ever felt and 10 being the best you've ever felt. And then that gives those students a chance to really talk about how they're feeling. Like if they, you know, are on the negative end, then you know you need to space, pay special attention to those students. Um, I also like to tell teachers to create what I call a wardrobe, ward, W-O-R, 
wardrobe because a lot of times students don't have the words to express how they're feeling. So you want to maybe on your chalkboard or somewhere, just have a list of different feelings. And then you can even point and say to your kids, hey, use your words. What, which one of those are, you, which one of those would represent you best right now? And then for the little ones, you have a bunch of smiley faces or frowny faces or faces that express emotions. And you can have them point to how they're feeling and then be open to listening. And you're gonna listen for those desolate Ds. And if anything seems like something you can't handle, you refer out the social worker, the guidance counselor, administrators, whomever. Yeah, that was a, that was a lot of good knowledge there. I was right. I was writing down some for myself. Uh, you know, uh -huh. the desolate Ds. Do the check in. You know, and mm -hmm. make sure that the check in is age appropriate. Um, I want to bring um, Dr. George in the conversation and hear about some other tools um, that teachers can use. Um, uh, tools that maybe your organization has or resources that your organization has. And then I want to set our panel up for this next question. Um, after he talks to us about some tools, I want to think about best case scenarios. In your experience, what are some things for our students, what are some things that your teachers have done that have supported you uh, when you felt like the conversation was difficult or there was a void? Or, or Anne, uh, what are some things that an administrator has done? So I'd love to hear, like, this is a positive experience of how we navigated um, this difficult conversation or either this void. This is how we've navigated in a positive way. But first of all, uh, Dr. George, what are some resources or tools? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I believe like when we engage in this work, we, we get further together. And so I think one of the biggest tools that we can all lean on is the more recent um, Ed Trust is uh, Truth in Classrooms Coalition, like being a part of that network and engage within that network. There's a slew of organizations and individuals that are connected there, in addition to also having a web page that has a, a slew of resources that are available for folks to engage in. Um, I think that, you know, we could have our silo opportunities where we're trying to address this but I think that collective impact is extremely important the other thing I will say is I think we need um educators to just be more knowledgeable and aware of what the language actually says about the legislation the actual bill you know it's a lot of people just broadly say CRT just CRT and that's not it um I think people need to really be knowledgeable I think leveraging things like again resources that are in the truth in classroom coalition but the ACLU Tennessee has a fact sheet that's available that kind of gives guidance around what the bill says what it doesn't say and some credence towards like what you can and cannot do based on the legislation so I think becoming more knowledgeable about the bill and then just being taking advantage of being in community with people who are at different levels aware of this, wanting to engage with this, but they need a starting point. And I think the, the, minute, the opportunity that we create to bring community together so we can move forward together, it's extremely important. Coalition is the, is the wave. Um, beyond that, I think the other thing that we're doing right now is, I think um, we launched a program more recently with Teach Plus nationally, it's a, called the Ascension Project. It's focused on supporting candidates of color that are training to be teachers um, here in, at Prep Pro in, in Tennessee. The program is currently piloted in Middle Tennessee. But what we're learning from, from candidates in color is that they are keenly aware of this legislature, but their prep programs haven't made the shift to prepare them to be able to teach in environments where this, where this is a real thing. So you have people right now in that program that are juniors and seniors, six of them are seniors, that are graduating in May, and they're looking for jobs right now, but they haven't been, the, the shift hasn't been made and they haven't been prepared to walk in the classroom and begin to adhere to this legislation. And so we're trying to supplement and provide resources to better prepare them and make them knowledgeable, like what that space is gonna look like and what they can and cannot do to be in compliance, but then also uh, still value, honor, and support their students in the most most um, expressive and, and, and the ways necessary for them to be successful. Yeah, I, I think you made an excellent point about our prep programs, right? Um, I, I should say I, ha I have a niece now who's going through a prep program and just stopping to think about, you know, when the curriculum was designed and was her uh, student teacher curriculum designed with, oh, there's a new legislation that just took effect in July, right? Um, you know, what does that do for our new teachers coming out or coming into the classroom who were trained under a certain curriculum and now have to be swift on their feet. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a I think that's an excellent, excellent point. 
um, I'm opening back up to the panel. I asked you for mm -hmm. what are some things in your own experiences that teachers have done or that administrators have done that made you feel really supportive in moments where there were difficult conversations or you were talking about art history? I, well, oh, does somebody else have? Well, one thing I've learned in working with administrators who are really in tune with how their teachers are feeling, they have done things like um, set up rooms for them to de-stress or to just kind of get back in touch with themselves and to refresh. And that has been very helpful. Just their attitude toward the teachers and just letting them know, hey, I know you're under a lot. This is a lot. And one thing I want to say about those new teachers, I've worked a lot with new teachers. Those are often the ones who actually come and talk to me because they're under so much stress. And a lot of times it comes from them being prepared in one way, but then real life is another way. And I think that really leads to new teachers leaving the profession because they feel so frustrated. So those administrators who notice that and direct them to me or to other people so they can just talk about it and feel heard has been very helpful. Great. Yeah. So checking in, giving them room and space to feel heard. How about from, from uh, some of our students? What have teachers done in the classroom that made you feel supported after hard conversations or avoid in the conversation even? For me, um, I can think of two things. Um, so the first thing is I wrote this um, article about critical race theory for my newspaper and just kind of like how I feel about it and how, um, like how I feel what should be taught in schools. And it was very like, I was very nervous to like write it and publish it because like I said earlier, this isn't really discussed in my community. Um, I don't know how supported it is in my community because it's just not really talked about, but you know, you can kind of guess. And um, so I was very nervous to like write that. And um, my teachers, um, two of my English teachers, the one I had currently and the one I had the year before, they both read my article and they said very nice things about it. And you know, they're very like positive and I didn't even like send it to them for them to read so they were like read it on their own and then like told me that you know they enjoyed the reading and that was just um it was very nice to hear that especially because I was so nervous about it and then the other thing it's not necessarily um about a hard time but um my math teacher um every day he asks us to rate like how our day is going and it's at the end of the day. So it's kind of like, how has your day been? And if there's like, if everyone kind of has like low numbers, he like gives all of us mints. And you wouldn't, you'd be surprised how much like a mint like changes my day. Like I'm always very happy to get a mint. So it's just like, um, and that's something that improves my day and something my teachers do. Um, just to echo a few things. Um, Having teachers ask you how your day was as simple as that is, um, it really is appreciated and helpful for students. Um, sometimes more than adults really know and consider, um, especially after coming from two years, not really having a sense of normal in the school environment, mental health should be put out of focus more than ever. Um, but a specific thing that one of my teachers have done um, especially for um, the state of the world out of, outside of this country really um, is just ask to free write and talk about how you're feeling at that moment. No structure. You could use however um, diction or structure you want for this free write essay. And that is something that we would do um, maybe every two months now in my AP literature class. And it's something that sets that class apart and sets my teacher apart. Um, but I'm honestly really fortunate to be in a school um, with teachers that considers the mental health and views of their students.
Yeah, let's give those teachers a shout out. What, what, what's the name of that teacher? I mean, every teacher wants to hear that's something that sets my teacher apart. What's her name or what's his name? Um, my AP literature teacher's name is Mike Morello. All right, Mike Morello. I hope you hear this somewhere. As former teacher, I can tell you, I'm smiling for Ms. Morello. Right? Uh, we have a great question from our audience. And I want to tell you, this is a hot button question, guys. So get ready for this one, all right? This is from Judy. Judy wants to know how um, are administrators, teachers, students communicating with parents who have picked up hostility towards social justice? What is the best way to engage with parents who are hostile on this issue? Or what is the best way to educate parents who are, hot, who are hostile to these issues? I don't know who wants that, but that's, that's a hot one right there. Darius, I'm going to ask you to jump in here. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you're talking to teachers, and I know teachers are always talking to parents. Yeah, yeah. I think that folks are trying to figure that out in real time. I think that th because of the ramifications that are associated with conversation, people are picking and choosing who they can engage with and who they can who they plan to steer clear from to be honest with you um i was in a, i was having a conversation you know we have some leadership development programs and we were uh you know we support folks in a fellowship program and then we support some mentors that are supporting our candidates of color and um we had some conversation this past weekend and folks were talking about man it's been a, it's been a year and conversations with parents have been this and you know one of our um educators supports a rural community um or is in between like an urban and rural community and um you know she was just saying that that she was leery of having conversations around some of the topics because you know she's one of the few educators of color in that community in that district uh at the school and she's leery of drawing light to her as opposed to where she you know when she worked in um um Davidson County and another larger district, it just, the, the vibe was different. And so I think folks are literally picking and choosing their battles. And I don't know that, that the strategy attached to it just yet because of the social political climate that we're navigating. Um, I do think that as, as opportunities present themselves, you know, I'm a parent myself. And so I, I think that as opportunity to, 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 um, drive parents towards resources similar to like we've acknowledged to on the call today I think we need to take advantage of that and do that as much as we can but um I think the the ability in which to open and honestly engage I think going back to some points and made earlier it, it, it that polarization is real and people are navigating literally could be district to district school to school within the district but they're trying to fill it out to see where are people at because a lot of people don't you know, parent teacher conferences and these different types of things, you don't, you don't know your parents' political views and political stands and how they show up in the, with these kinds of kinds of things. And that's from my own personal experience teaching. And then you see them somewhere, you hear something that happens and an off comment comes, you know, oh, I didn't know that about this person. Or I didn't assume that about this person. And then it makes you think about how do I navigate? And I, it, you know, I think more guidance is necessary and needed there, but to the extent that we can continue to drive people towards resources that are available, especially for educational purposes, that's necessary. We got to do that. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to ask um, Ann to jump in and then Dr. K, just um, from either your experience or what you've heard from coworkers, colleagues, how do you navigate these conversations with parents? Yeah, so um, I think in my experience and, you know, just recognizing that as a white woman in this space, this has been a different experience for me than other educators of color. I think there's a lot less at stake for me to have those conversations with um, parents in some context. Um, so what I've really tried to do is leverage my identity in those conversations with parents that might not want to talk about these hard concepts. Um, and to really come at it as a place of understanding um, and come at it as a place from, we have to respect our students' identities in this school. Um, so we're a school that's made up of 33% um, Latino, 33% Black, 33% White. So we're pretty diverse. So when you come to the table and you tell a parent, um, I'm not, you know, I'm just an educator. I'm not gonna sit in this classroom and act like, you know, a whole population of students doesn't exist. Um, I'm not gonna sit in this classroom and only serve one population of students. Um, so I think, you know, as a white educator, as someone who really tries to be an advocate and a voice for my students, um, that's 
that's where I've had the best conversations with parents is just, I'll respect your child. You have to respect my kids. Um, and I see my kids as my kids and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have conversations that are important to them, that are important to their identities, that are important to their cultures. Um, and you just have to be okay with that. Um, and I think for me also from a point of privilege of having a supportive administration that would let me do that. I love that framing there. Yeah. Just remember your own identity and how you're entering the conversation. Yeah. Dr. K has given you the nod of, of approval there. Yeah. Dr. K, jump in. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, I, I always look at people, whomever they are, whatever they think, they still have, you need to give them respect. And there is a way to do that throughout this pandemic of racial inequality, education, all of this, I've come up with the five Ks of being okay. And I've used this and I apply it to almost every situation. So usually when things like this happen, the person is like right there in your face. And the first thing that you do is you stop breathing because you're in shock of what they said. So the first K is keep breathing. So you want to do some brief, deep breathing exercises. Then the next one is you want to keep being kind. So you want to think about that other person as this is a human being and they're feeling afraid or however they're feeling. So you want to remember to be kind to them and to be kind to yourself. Then the sex, second one is keep being grateful. So you want to think about what's good about this situation. You know, at least they're talking to me and they're not hitting me, or at least, you know, we're taking the time out to get to know each other. So you want to keep being grateful. And then that's when you want to keep talking. And there is a way to talk. Uh, and number one, using I messages saying, I feel and why and what you would like to ha happen, but then also to listen. You want to listen to what that person is saying. You want to repeat what they're saying. You want to identify the feeling in what they're saying and then suggest some sort of solution, which is the last K, keep planning. So usually once people are heard and you've talked about how they feel, now they're calm enough for you to, to come up with some plans like, hey, let me get you some literature on this. Or why don't you come in and sit and watch what we're talking about or things of that nature. So it's really about making everyone a human who has feelings that need to be recognized and then coming up with a solution from there. Yeah, I think that's so important to uh, keep being grateful and keep being kind which is hard, right? When someone's coming at you about something that's a disagreement or a confrontation, but to center the humanity of that person as well, even in that moment of disagreement. I think a lot of people need to learn that lesson, right? Um, we gotta center the humanity of others, even when we disagree with them. Um, yeah, I think those are excellent, excellent tips. We have another pretty uh, hot button question from the audience. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna hear from this from both our students and any of our other panelists. Sarah says, a lot of this comes down to trust. Students, do you trust your teachers to deliver information in a fair and balanced way? Teachers, so Miss, uh, Miss B, that would be you. Do you feel trusted? Students, do you trust your teachers to deliver information, hard information, controversial information in a fair and balanced way. And Iris, do teachers feel trusted in this moment? Uh, Jamal, I wanna hear from you. I haven't heard your, your voice in a minute. Do you trust your teachers to deliver information in a fair and balanced way? Um, yes, um, I do actually, but it also depends, like it depends on the experience of how long you knew, how long you knew that you have known the teacher and um, your bond with them, and also um, previous time that you've seen them. That's basically, in my personal opinion, it just it's just the bond that you have with your teacher. To be honest. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, bond and time matters. How about uh, Ivy or Angelou? Do you trust your teachers to deliver information in a fair and balanced way? I do really trust my teachers um, and that can just come from um, 
the relationships that I've formed with them. But with that being said, I wouldn't put it up against me to really challenge the views that my teachers deliver. Um, with that comes respect as well. Um, I trust my teachers and I'm someone who tries to see both sides of a story as we know that history in our textbooks aren't really unbiased. So there's always some sense of bias um, in which a sense of information is being delivered to students and people have their own opinions and I want to respect that with my teachers. So if something um, slips out with their personal opinions, that is completely fine as long as we explore the possibilities of other opinions as well. So just having a full spectrum of open discussion is something that I really value in the classroom and which is why I really value um, the consideration of my teachers and their delivery of um, their lessons that may be controversial and in violation of this bill. Yeah, I love that framing. You trust your teachers to listen even when you disagree, right? Yeah, and, and that's important, right? Yeah, how about you, Ivy? Do you trust your teachers to deliver information in a fair and balanced way? Um, I do trust my teachers. Throughout um, like all the history classes I've taken, my teachers, I mean, they're pretty upfront about this, but they, they're pretty clear that they're not teaching this or trying to teach it from like a certain perspective or like from a certain like viewpoint, they're trying to do it really like unbiased. And I mean, I think they're doing a really good job because I couldn't really say um, kind of like the personal beliefs as those teachers especially have. Like in my, especially in my government class, like I have no idea how my government teacher lies. So they did it very like un, in an unbiased way. And I do think, you know, they're trying the best with the guidelines that they're given. And um, they allow students to give their perspectives. So even if, you know, they agree with it or not, they're not really showing it and they're allowing people to have the, the discussions amongst each other. Yeah, I want to I want to pause at this moment because I know we have a lot of teachers in the chat and teachers who are viewing us today. All three students said they trust their teachers. So if you are a teacher joining us today, take a moment to take that in to give yourselves a pat on the back because no matter what else is happening out in the world, your students trust you. And I think that's an important point. But let's hear how teachers are feeling. And Diaries, from your conversations, are teachers feeling trusted? Are teachers feeling like their expertise and their competency um, is valued and understood? I'll say from my perspective, um, and I think the biggest thing for me is that my students trust me to create that space for them. Um, and I think that for the most part, my students and I have co-created my classroom and my classroom space. Um, so I do my best to remove myself from a position of power in my classroom um, and to really invite conversation where my students um, are in collaboration with me as opposed to me just you know, talking at my students, forming my own opinions and then not being able to critique me. Um, so I think that, that with it, within a political environment like that, like when we were talking about World War II and Asian racism, and then we're making parallels to COVID and Asian racism, um, you have to come at that from a spirit of humbleness of, you know, I'm not talking at you, I'm not teaching at you, but let's have a conversation. And then if students need to critique me, if I say something that is not okay, then students feel that they can come and deconstruct that space with me and we can rebuild it together. Um, so that's how my relationship with my students, I feel like, has been over these last two years. Yeah, um, I would say, I would say yes and no. Uh, I would say yes overwhelmingly by students. Most students are coming in spaces where they're developing an academic identity. Their academic identity is largely fueled by their race, their gender, their previous history. So some of the same things that we're having challenges, we're having conversations about, these are the same things that individual students bring into the classrooms with them every single day. And literally the opportunities they have afforded to them are, are, are based on some of those same things that make up their, their academic identity. And yet it's still, students still trust teachers. 
trust is reciprocated from teachers to students. So I, I would say in that regard, and all the, the echoes on the on the panel from the students, is I, I can definitely feel that that the complaint necessarily doesn't come from the student perspective, where I think there is a little bit of mistrust is the broader community and the, the broader community that's made up of policymakers, influencers, parents, legislators. Um, there's a there's a there's mistrust there. Um, and wasn't we wouldn't have a lot of these legislatures on the table and a lot of these bills that have been signed into law because for some people in this profession it's almost a slap in the face as if folks don't know how to do their job and honor kids and value kids and the reality of it is is that everything that we're talking about again everything that we're talking about that the the level of discomfort and the pushback and the things that this the the, the legislator tells us not to be able to do kids are going to experience this if you think about it and i, can, I don't want to put kids on the spot here but Every kid on the on the call, if you ask them, have you ever personally experienced a form of racism or, or seen it in school? How about gender inequity? How about the misegregious or the erasure of history? People would probably, I would venture to estimate, say yes, right? And I think the reality of what we're talking about here and what we have to really drill drill down to, I think, is, is that you know, all of those elements and things that we're trying to avoid and, 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 and push out and leave out are some of the same things that take place in schools all the time. All the time. Kids are experiencing racism in school. Racism is, a, is, is if you don't believe it, Google. Google the stories across Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, West Tennessee, the stories about, you know, you know, I won't even go all in those details. But again, we have to be a little bit more, uh, uh, um, and, then, and, and even with all of that taking place, students on the call are still saying, I trust my teachers. Now, why, wh wh where's the community at? community with knowing that these things are taking place in the world that we've been, been impacted largely by systemic issues over the last couple of years and students are still saying I trust my teacher and, and, and to be honest with you and I stop here to be honest with you for some students that teacher is the most trusted person in their life right now it has been the last couple of years through all of the turmoil we've experienced but yet and still you got people up here feeling that they have to go down to the, to the capitol to fight against legislature that slaps them in the face and makes them feel like they can't do their job so I do think that there's a, an immense amount of mistrust between the broader community and educators who are showing up every single day to do a job that most people who have never done it can't identify. It's so much more than, than they were. We would need a, a whole year to go over how the intricate details of not just teaching kids, but taking care of them and make sure they're whole and they got food and all the things that, that, that really matter that sometimes just get dismissed and it gets overshadowed by what we're talking about right now. You mentioned distrust, and I know we're we're pushing up against our hour. Dr. K, very quickly, lean in here. How do we repair that distrust? What's one or two takeaways you can give us to dis repair this distrust that might be happening between policymakers and educators, between parents and educators, or the community and educators? Again, it's about listening to what someone is saying and then reflecting what you hear and the feeling behind it because a lot of times once we understand where a person is coming from and what they are saying and can identify with that feeling that's when you start to build a trust because now all of those other elements go away like even though i'm a black female listening to a white male talk to me i i don't know how it feels to be a white male but i know how it feels to be afraid i know how it feels to be how it is to be frustrated and have all, all of those emotions. So really taking the time out to use your active listening skills, listen to someone, repeat what they say, reflect back their feeling, and then come up with a solution together. And then checking yourself and knowing where you are with your feelings in that moment right in that moment, you know, am I feeling so ticked off here that I can't hear this person? And then being able to use those five Ks or whatever other methods you want to walk yourself back and get back to being able to listen and work with the other person. Wonderful, wonderful. I wanna shout out a question that we're not gonna to get to tonight, but I think it's an excellent question. And John, we're gonna answer this in the article. John wants to know, how about administrators? I hear Dr. George Ray all the way, all the time talking about the heavy burden that school leaders are carrying. So we talked about help for teachers. We talked about help for students. What's the help for administrators, for the counselors who are listening to these conversations every day? Uh, you guys got to read the article tomorrow because we're going to ask Dr. Streeter 
and Dr. George this question after this interview, after this panel. And we'll put that in the article, all right? I wanna close on a positive note. I think it's always good to think about the future, um, especially going back to that list where we talk about so many he heavy feelings and negative emotions. I wanna know what gives you hope in this moment. In this moment with so much going on, with growing distrust of teachers, as we wrap up a pandemic, as we have more legislation that's coming that might make teachers, administrators, students, as the kids say, feel some type of way, right? <laughs> What gives you hope in this moment? Uh, we'll, we'll start with Ivy, and then we'll go to Dr. George and Jamal, and uh, Dr. K, and then Angelie, we'll let you have the last word. All right. um, I guess it's bad, I can't exactly think of something that gives me hope, at least for this situation. I will say, even though you know teachers might not be able to teach the way they want or share the type of history that they want, at least I still know that like um, the teachers like still care about the students, and I still feel very supported by my teachers, even though we're not talking about these social issues. Um, I still feel supported and cared for by them. Yeah, um, I think the just seeing young people on the call today um, and knowing that like their space is being held for, for student voice to be elevated, shared across the across um, the education system in the state. It gives me a lot of hope because I think that that's the one voice that's been absent in a lot of the decisions that have been made, uh, both at legislative levels, local levels, in between. Um, we got to honor and value our students, and I appreciate y'all be holding the space to be able to um, to center them. I mean, literally, y'all are in the center of my screen too, so that <laughs> makes it even better. Um, what gives me hope is knowing that as long as long as there's still life in the world, it's always hope. I agree with that. I think um, being able to look backwards and looking forwards, looking back, knowing that we've gone through issues, not this exact issue, but we've gone through other times of racial strife and tension and, you know, fighting between the, the sexes and all of those different things. So none of this is new. It may be at a different level. It may be spoken in a different way, but conflict is conflict. And so throughout the years, we always figure out a way to kind of get through at least that amount of conflict and emerge even stronger. And so that looking back to see what we've done before, we're doing it again, but looking forward, we know that in some way we're gonna get over it and figure out a new way of being. Yeah, I think for me, just thinking about um, everything has a reaction. Um, and I think the reaction we're seeing right now with people who want to stand by our students, who want to, um, you know, honor their identities, honor their um, complex histories. Um, my family always says that diamonds are forged under pressure. And I think we're under a lot of pressure right now. Um, and that really spectacular things can come from people being forced to stand together. Um, and figure out how we're going to move forward. Um, the support of teachers like Ms. B and the adults in this room um, really give me hope, as well as the resilience that our students have. Um, it's tough being a teenager alone, but living through a pandemic and living through all the social injustices that we've had to really put through um, the past few years is a lot and it shouldn't be taken lightly so it gives me hope and peace. I think that was beautifully beautifully stated. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've enjoyed hearing all of your perspectives such a uh, rich rich panel. Uh, I know it's a question and answer but if you are in the audience and you've heard something that you like from a panelist put it in the Q&A shout them out we're going to go back and read this, and I just want to send them some love for volunteering their time today. I want to thank Ed Trust for co-hosting this event with Chalkbeat. Uh, uh, we're so glad for all of the resources that they brought to the table. 
uh, thanks to Marta Aldrich. And I have to thank Caroline, who is not here, but she did all of the logistics for us. So Caroline, I know you're off camera, but this is your flowers. I hope you hear this. And then check out the story from Sammy West tomorrow as we do a recap. The one thing I want to take away from this conversation is, A, we got to check in with each other, guys. We got to check in. We got to check in. And B, my favorite point of the night, teachers, your students trust you. Thank you so much for joining us.